The Brussels Report podcast. Welcome to the uh, fifth edition of the uh, Brussels Report podcast. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kleppe. I'm the editor in chief of Brussels Report uh, EU, and I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to have with me here uh, in real life, and not just a webinar, because COVID is slowly uh, coming to an end. Let's hope that uh, uh, Sajat Karim. Uh, who is a, a British politician, a solicitor, and uh, who has been for a long time a, a member of, of the European Parliament for 15 years. So, um, um, welcome. Peter, it's good to be here. It's good to be in Brussels as well. Great. Uh, so, um, I'd like to discuss with you, of course, the obvious uh, most important issue in uh, British um uh, European relation, and that is uh, Brexit. I've been working on this topic for a very long time uh, myself. And uh, as they say in the United Kingdom, uh, we are where we are. So uh, there's been a referendum. Uh, this was uh, implemented. Um, a Brexit deal was concluded. First, the divorce agreement, then at the end of, uh, of last year, the uh, TCA, the free trade deal between uh, Britain and the EU. Uh, despite all that, uh, a lot of stuff still has to be sorted out. Uh, only today, uh, uh, David Frost, the uh, chief negotiator of the UK government, wrote in the FT, uh, stressing the, point, the, the, the position of the UK uh, when it comes to the Irish uh, sea border. And so the idea that... Um, uh, there have to be uh, checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland to avoid some kind of a backdoor um, into the EU. Um, now, uh, what, what's your um, what's your position here specifically on the Irish sea border, but maybe also broadly, given that we have this trade deal agreement here, uh, in your view, what should be the priority to, to try to soften it, to mend it, to improve it uh, in the context of what's possible, of course? Well, I think really we, we don't have much choice. Uh, we've got to be absolutely practical on both sides, on the British side and the EU side, uh, because ultimately we're talking uh, here about peace on the island of Ireland uh, and making sure that uh, all of the terms of the Good Friday Agreement are upheld, uh, that we avoid a border on the island of Ireland itself. Um, if we are unable to be pragmatic, I'm afraid uh, the tensions are already rising. Um, we are seeing uh, both within the Republican communities uh, in Northern Ireland and in the Unionist community uh, a real upping of the tempo. Um, it is a, a rather unfortunate situation, uh, but in many ways we, we have no choice but to be practical about it. My own personal and honest feeling is uh, this is where Boris Johnson always wanted this to head. He knew full well uh, on the day that he agreed that border down the sea um, that it would lead to these tensions. Uh, but uh, he will now use that as leverage uh, to gain more concessions from the European Union on a pragmatic basis. But of course, the European Union has to protect its single market. If it gives um, too much away on that, uh, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the union for? Uh, and many other members will ask that question. So this is a very delicate balancing act now. Um, but of course, um, there are many things that can be resolved, for instance, by the introduction of an SVS agreement. Mm -hmm. This is something that is being put on the table by the European Union. Uh, but so far hasn't been taken up by the British government. Um, there will need to be some movement from the British government on this. Uh, but, you know, these negotiations are going to have to take place in a very pragmatic way. Uh, and indeed, the more interesting new uh, element to all of this, of course, is uh, the new uh, administration in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. and its commitment to upholding the Good Friday Agreement. So hopefully between the UK, the EU, uh, with um, some help from our American friends, uh, we can arrive at some solution. 
So if I can go a bit more um, into depth when it comes to this uh, SPS check, so, so basically this is about mostly agricultural trade, right? And, and if I'm not mistaken, Switzerland and the EU have such an agreement, meaning that even if there's tariffs on Swiss EU agricultural trade, um, the, the EU uh, doesn't uh, bother uh, Swiss agricultural imports with these burdensome checks, which have, I, if I'm not mistaken, prevented Scottish fishermen to get their fish on the EU market. Now, would it not be perhaps a good compromise that uh, the EU explores the equivalence ID that the British government is putting forward, that uh, the EU basically says, okay, fine, we can accept that your agricultural products, which are basically regulated by EU standards, as the EU has taken these over, uh, that, that uh, we just accept these standards. But every year or every um, X year, there will be a review. And then we retain the right to say, well, we, you've just been changing all your agricultural standards. Uh, there goes that deal. W would that, for example, not be a, let's say, middle of the road uh, fudge uh, to all of this or... or it's a possible way forward uh, because it helps to deal with the British demand for sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is, of course, a complicating factor, and that is that the United Kingdom uh, is already now currently in negotiations with non-EU countries for trade agreements, which cover those items that would be within such an SPS. Uh, and that's where the whole issue of standards immediately comes to the fore. Um, Negotiations with the USA are going to be particularly interesting in this regard as well. But I know in my former constituency in the northwest of England, up in Cumbria, uh, many of the farmers, uh, both um, uh, those that supplied into the beef markets and the lamb markets, uh, are actually already very worried by a potential agreement with Australia. Mm -hmm. So this is a very complicating factor and something that Europe really needs a huge amount of reassurance on. Uh, because, of course, the United Kingdom could well arrive at an agreement uh, that needs some form of change in the way that it is currently applying its standards. And, um, you know, that could directly impact not just on the European markets, but on uh, issues... Um, uh, pertaining to all of the innovation that's going on as well in farming methods, mm. uh, etc. You know, if the UK chooses to go down a certain road, which is not something the EU is signed up to, uh, then problems emerge immediately. So, you know, w with all of this, as, as is, is with everything with Brexit, um, there is no simple solution. Um, there is always going to need be a need for reviews. There is always going to be a need for sunset clauses. Uh, to be negotiated on any agreements that are arrived at uh, and with potential break uh, clauses available, um, you know, should either side diverge in any particular way. Um, but as I say, and I go back to my initial point, I really hope that we, we are pragmatic about this mm -hmm. because the alternative is um, unrest on the island of Ireland and the sort of developments that we saw in Jersey with the fishing fleets, French fishing fleets, fairly recently, uh, and an increasing uh, pressure uh, in the fishing communities in particular in Scotland, uh, and how that is entering into uh, the debate on Scottish nationalism and potential independence of Scotland as well. So, you know, there are real ramifications in all of this, not just uh, for the unity of the UK, uh, but I would beg to suggest also um, there are potential ramifications in terms of uh, the European Union's unity itself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it looks like a really, uh, oh, I shouldn't say a toxic mix, mix, but quite tricky because you have a, a mix of uh, the, the, the very problematic situation in, in Northern Ireland and, and all the uh, emotions there combined with uh, agriculture, which is, is a, an economic sector that, that in every single country is, uh, is, is, I would say, treated in a relatively protectionist way with lots of vested interest. Uh, so so uh, really, maybe indeed, uh, like you say, um, has to be handled carefully, at least, and, and some wise. Well, you know, when you look at the old border on the island of Ireland, 
uh, you have got farmlands which have literally hundreds of crossing points in them. And it is absolutely impossible for those farmers to farm those lands mm. uh, if those uh, old borders are to be reinstated. It just becomes absolutely impossible. You just can't do it. Mm. Um, so, you know, th th this is not just some theoretical discussion. This is practical. This is real. This is everyday mm. effects. And then, of course, on top of that, you have... Um, all of those old historical ties, those people who feel tied to uh, uh, Great Britain through the United Kingdom. Uh, and, of course, you now also have new generations on the island of Ireland that take a much different view and much more pragmatic view um, because they've never seen those old troubles. They've been fortunate enough to grow up at a time where they really didn't have to worry about which side of the line that they were on. And you could cross endlessly without any interruption to your movement. But, you know, uh, I go back to where you started. We are where we are. Mm -hmm. And um, I just hope that, um, I mean, I, I'm certainly not uh, uh, pro-European conservatives, I should say. We, we're not in a position at this moment in time because we've been well and truly uh, sidelined by this current uh, conservative administration so we're not in a position to provide the pragmatic solutions. Uh, if we were uh, in power, we certainly would be looking for a very pragmatic solution. Um, you know, they've won the ideological argument. Uh, now is not the time to push ideology to a point where you break people's everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but so I think uh, you're you're maybe not in charge in the in the party and the government, but at least. Uh, it's fair to say that you, you, you could serve as the bridge between uh, the, the EU side and, um, and the British Conservative government. And David Frost, um, um, if, you, if you look at, uh, indeed, um, I mean, the core of the issue, I always say that uh, the EU is, it, it, I mean, it's justified for the European Union to fear some kind of a backdoor. But then on the other hand, I mean, being Belgian myself, the real big entry port into the European Union is the port of Antwerp, Antwerp combined with the port of Rotterdam, where 1% of the trade is being inspected. And according to Bart de Wever, the, the mayor of Antwerp, uh, both ports are, are leaking like a sieve. He, he, was, he was talking about illegal drugs, but that's the reality. So um, I, I do think that should serve as an argument for those at the EU policy level to say, OK, fine. Obviously, the UK has to give some way. Uh, it was agreed that there would be checks and we have to stick to the agreement between um, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But on the other hand, let's not be hysterical about this possible backdoor um, when we're not actually properly checking our two biggest entry gates into our single market. So, well, anyway, I I'm, I'm feel like some middle way has have to be found. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way I see it, there is no other way. Neither side is going to get 100% of what it wanted. Mm. The negotiations took place in a certain way. Uh, unfortunately, the British politics was such that um, uh, Boris Johnson was able to swing it behind um, what he told the British people at the time, which was a very simple message of just get Brexit done. And of course, it's a very complex issue. He also promised that there would be no border down uh, the sea between uh, mm. GB and Northern Ireland, but of course there is. Uh, and today, all of that needs a solution. So whilst we, we may take the view that actually it's Boris Johnson that has deceived the British people, uh, ultimately, we've all got to find a solution, irrespective of who it was that was the cause of all of this. Mm. Well, OK, before we go maybe to the, the long term, um goal, what, what's the long term now? First, maybe um, a number of other issues apart from Northern Ireland need to be fudged. Uh, so I'm talking about the Lugano Convention, basically uh, allowing um, the UK uh, and uh, UK judicial uh, pronouncements uh, to be uh, easily recognized um, across uh, the member states of, of that convention. Um, recognition of data, uh, very important. 
financial services, equivalence, uh, granting equivalence, uh, mm. regulation by regulation. I mean, yeah, what, where do you think um, are we going here? Is there a lot of scope for, let's say, uh, preventing uh, market access damage or uh, actually um, is it uh, unrealistic to expect uh, that um, yeah, th this can be mended. Uh, also, the issue of the music bands uh, wanting to tour Europe, uh, British pensioners having an easy time uh, residing in the EU. I mean, is the, um, in your view, the Brexit deal uh, is going to make it very hard for those things to continue? Or do we now, in the next year, basically still have the scope to try to soften this as much as possible? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I still remain quite positive. Um, that we can uh, actually move um, increasingly in a, a more positive direction once we've got over uh, the initial very hardline position that we're seeing coming um, from this particular government. Uh, and what I say to our EU partners is simply this, that, um, look, this government's not going to be here forever. There is going to come a point at which this ideological government uh, is going to have to give way to much more practical individuals. And it would be a, a real shame if permanent damage was done to our relations um, because of this particular time period. Um, having said that, uh, of course, I mean, on financial services, for instance, uh, the City of London is today suffering. There's no doubt about that. But that, that was a, a known known. You know, this was something that was clear right from the outset. Uh, and within the city the, uh, of London itself, generally the feeling is that we have been very badly let down by our own government. That's the bottom line. Uh, but the city is going to have to readjust. And, you know, one does get it in this sense that, look, you know, um, we were a country that was not in the Eurozone. But yet, look at the share of the Eurozone clearing market that we had. Mm. Now, when one looks um, at the politics of that, and you yourself as a country are asking for greater control and greater sovereignty, then you have to understand that this is a currency that you are not a part of. And therefore, it's only natural that those countries that are a part of it want to bring it on shore, so to speak, you know, into their own jurisdictions, into their own geography. So it's very difficult for somebody like me to understand those Brits who argue for Brexit, but at the same time argue that why is it that the Euro business is being taken in this way? I mean, I, I think it's logical one follows the other. Um, so, you know, that sort of thing is where it is, but the city is just going to have to be far more imaginative about uh, how it goes about um, uh, now um, facing these new circumstances. On things like data, actually, you know, here, Peter, there's a huge amount at stake mm. because uh, with all of the new digital stroke data uh, developments and uh, the digital economy, um, that's developing globally. Um, we have got so much to lose if we are not working closely with those economies that we are bound to on a values basis. And that's why I was actually really encouraged when I heard uh, that apparently the, the new administration in the USA had put forward a proposal whereby on data, um, there would be three parties at the table, the USA, the EU, and the UK. Yes, that's good. Uh, and this is something that uh, the United Kingdom still hasn't responded to positively. Uh, to be honest, if I was a Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, I wouldn't wait a second. I would immediately take that opportunity to make sure that all three of us are at the table together, uh, because this is such a vital part Yes. Uh, of how things are going to go. 
it affects our security. If I, if I may interrupt, indeed, like um, also the data relationship, so to speak, between America and Europe is very uh, shaky mm. because every so many times there's another uh, European Court of Justice ruling, declaring it uh, illegal to transfer data to the states, but then the US is never going to change their data regulation on the request of uh, the EU, but we still all use Facebook and WhatsApp. Uh, so indeed uh, something. And then you have London, which is the innovation hub of Europe, uh, where you have many uh, new uh, companies offering all kinds of uh, services that are all very closely uh, dependent on data regulation. So indeed some, uh, some, some arrangement, in my view, it would be about equivalence and trusting each other's regulation. But something along, something has to be found uh, to, to but, but, yeah, settle yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, Peter, and you've got to add to that the following: mm. that today you have the emergence, bearing in mind that we're in a new data digital world. Mm. You have got the emergence, on the one hand, economies you have described, of open, tolerant, liberal societies that share values. Mm. And then on the other side, you have got many economies that do not share those values. And therefore, somebody like me will always put forward um, a proposal that actually we, we're never going to be on the same page completely. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. And that shouldn't be our aim. But the aim should be that we find ourselves at a point where the propositions that we have on data are workable solutions. Uh, and there's no reason as to why that can't be the case, providing we're at the table. Uh, and that's where I, as a Brit, um, find it very difficult to understand why we as a country haven't immediately responded in a positive way to that offer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, maybe then let's move to the last topic uh, when it comes to the EU. Uh, so basically, um, look, let's let's uh, um, try to soften the, this uh, TCA, this Brexit deal, as much as we can within the context of what has been agreed. But then going forward in 10, 15, maybe 20 years, in your view, what should happen? Should, should the UK join uh, the EU, rejoin? Should the UK perhaps join EFTA, something I personally would, uh, would support, because it would then be able to work with the likes of Switzerland, and also Norway uh, to try to uh, you know um, uh, open up trade between um, uh, between the EU and its uh, immediate uh, neighbors uh, more. Um, and and if the e UK were to uh, join the uh, rejoin the EU, um, what in your view should happen from the EU side to sort of convince the UK to become a member state again? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that actually this is all still far too new. Um, there is far too much that still needs sorting out in terms of uh, the divorce settlement, so to speak. Then um, we, we, we need some time to allow the UK to figure out what its new identity is to be. Bearing in mind, uh, based upon the most recent uh, election results in Scotland and Wales, um, we are seeing the emergence of, um, uh, at this moment in time, it is a rejection of English dominance. Um, it could well be, actually, that the only way really to save the United Kingdom uh, is to have a new settlement um, with uh, complete constitutional reform, uh, electoral reform, political reform, uh, in order uh, for there to be a new workable form of United Kingdom. Um, or the alternative is that um, at some stage, uh, Scotland may well have the opportunity to, to, to vote, uh, and it votes for independence. It may then want to rejoin the EU or not, I don't know, time will tell. Uh, it may want to become a republic. It may not. We don't know. Uh, so it's very interesting times we're in. And then we have the whole issue of a border poll in Ireland as well. Mm. So we've got all of these issues to face over the next five to ten years. That's just in the UK. Yes. And then um, also within Europe and the European Union, 
um, European Union now has to forge its way forward without the United Kingdom. Uh, and that's going to be a very interesting journey as well. Um, there are those who argue that actually now today, without the UK continually always pressing the brakes, uh, the EU is now free to move much more in a, an integrationalist federation yes. uh, type of model. Um, that a, may or may not a, happen. Well, with the recovery fund, I'm pretty sure that would not have uh, happened. It wouldn't have happened if the UK was absolutely, yeah. Um, so, you know, th th these huge changes uh, are, are there to take place. So I think we, we really have to go through all of that. Uh, but certainly from my perspective, um, uh, and not just my perspective, the perspective of centre-right politicians in the UK, uh, we take the view that actually we, we need to keep a very close or as close as we possibly can relationship with the European Union, but also, of course, with the USA, because, as I say before, we are open, liberal, tolerant societies. And as long as we remain that, um, you know, we're in a strong position. But it does worry you. I mean, uh, worry me. I speak as an Englishman. Um, I do worry that if the UK does find itself where we split up, well, what sort of a, a country will England be? I worry that it won't be an open, liberal society in the way that it is now. It will probably remain a democracy, but I think it will become a very different form uh, of society. And that change could happen really rather quickly. Um, so, you know, everything is in a state of flux at this moment in time and really is in our in all of our advantage to make sure we maintain a really close relationship um, and then see how things develop and let future generations then make their choices based upon where we are at that stage. Having said that, uh, I'm a member of the executive committee of the European Movement in the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, and it is our stated aim um, to firstly be as close as we possibly can to the European Union uh, and ultimately have a, uh, a an aim of campaigning uh, to rejoin the European Union. And do you think, uh, let's say, in order to maximize your chances, uh, if the EU would uh, ask your advice and say, OK, like, um, tell us three things, three things that we can do, so to help uh, help you win in the UK, convince the British public to rejoin, what were, would those three things be? Um, don't, don't react to the ideological positions that have been adopted by British, certain British politicians and the British government. That would, I mean, I, I hate using the term giving advice to my European Union uh, colleagues and friends and family indeed, but... Um, I think point one, I would say, please resist this. It's being done intentionally with a purpose in mind, and that is to create distance between us. Secondly, take every opportunity available to us to make sure that we remain bound on a values basis. Because as long as our values are shared, we stick a chance. When our values start to diverge, then naturally we're going to move apart. And that's no good for us. It's no good for the European Union. And it's no good for individual countries within the European Union or the UK itself, even on a bilateral basis. Where values start to diverge, then real divisions and problems will uh, start to emerge. And all that is going to do is weaken us. And it will weaken us all. If any one of us is weakened by this process, we are all weakened. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I would just like to say that no matter how difficult the politics becomes, please keep an eye on the greater picture. And then very finally, the, the thing that worries me uh, is the point I made before about England. But I also see, for instance, the presidential elections coming uh, in France. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm tremendously worried mm -hmm. that we may find ourselves in a position that even if Marine Le Pen doesn't become president, she wins the election. Mm. Wins in the sense that actually the other competitors have given so much ground to things that she was arguing for that her agenda 
becomes the next working term. Uh, and we just can't afford for that to happen. And uh, when I see, for instance, President Macron and, and the way in which he is reacting in France, the, this causes me great concern. Uh, and even, you know, somebody I hugely respect, in fact, regard as a friend, Michel Barnier, um, a statement he made only, uh, you know, a couple yes. of weeks ago uh, about um, no further immigration into France. I mean, come on, you know, this is effectively saying we're going to shut our economy down. Yeah. You know, I mean, to be on, fair, I also know? commented on that and, and he was a bit more qualified. But uh, yeah, he also left some room for ambiguity because he was obviously preparing his potential presidential run. Yeah, but, you know, I, I want to be in a position to uh, uh, go to France and support him uh, in sure. his campaign. Mm. Um, but obviously, you know, with, um, you know, populist, irresponsible even. Uh, messaging that's not precise, um, you know, it's going to create difficulties because all it's going to do is take a wonderful society like France, a, a wonderful country, uh, and it's going to move it into a political space that is actually alien to France and the nature of France. Uh, and France itself is going to struggle to cope uh, with the after effects of that. Interesting, uh, which actually brings us to the last topic I want to I wanna discuss uh, because uh, I I've always found it very unfair for, uh, in the wake of Brexit, the UK being described as some kind of a provincial backwater that that is actually turning in itself. Whereas in reality, I think it's fair to say that especially London, but, but more than just London, is, um, I mean, it's incredibly open to the world and, and has been incredibly successful also. As a part of that, of course, there's massive problems with integration, which you have in every single European country, including Belgium, my own. Uh, but going forward, I mean, being somebody who, who's, who's, uh, who's from a Pakistani family, right? And who has, I think, perhaps a more, um, yeah, a more experienced view than, than some other people. And, and what you mentioned about France ties into that. I mean, how uh, should Western Europe, so to speak, deal with this uh, because on the one hand you have um, a number of societies that are simply not used to the kind of uh, mass migration that we've seen and despite of all the undoubtable benefits many citizens are hesitant about that right um, and you see that in debates about should police women be allowed to wear headscarves and um, all kinds of other debates. So the UK has or seems to be a bit more relaxed about that. It, it seems to be dealing with that in a more or let's say less heated way. At least if you look at politics, you don't have somebody uh, like Marine Le Pen in British politics as close to <coughs> power, so to speak. I mean, that's an objective difference. And um, I don't think actually yes. in British politics we would ever see anybody like Marine Le Pen. In English politics, it could be quite a different story um, based upon you know, some of the um, uh, movements that are beginning to emerge, uh, mainly in England uh, and you know, English dominance. Um, so you know, that, that, that aspect of it worries me. You know... The, being British was always um, uh, 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 an all-encompassing concept. Um, you know, being British didn't mean that you had to speak only English, that you had to identify only in a certain way, or you had to wear only a certain type of attire. You know, being British actually um, encompassed lots of identities, uh, and they weren't seen as competing identities. Uh, they, they, you know, these mm. were complementary identities. Yes. I mean, for instance, in my case, I'm, I'm Lancastrian by birth, uh, which makes me an Englishman, uh, which makes me British, um, which makes me European. Uh, and as you've said, I am of Pakistani heritage and I happen to follow the Muslim faith. Now, I'm entirely comfortable with all of these identities. Mm. Uh, it's not an issue. There's no competition between any of these. I don't have to try and prove 
any one of these identities above any other. Mm-hmm. It's me. It's who I am. Uh, and actually, um, uh, I think if you were to examine every single European, uh, if you genuinely are to make yourself aware of their history, you will find we are all the same in that sense. That yes. There's no difference whatsoever. Okay. Um, but um, identity politics is a currency today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and what it actually means to me is that um, uh, we, we, we are shifting from societies that were incredibly comfortable in our own skin, um, incredibly mature, to um, a place where the political debate is dragging us to a point of weakness. Mm-hmm where we are beginning to question identity uh, in a way that actually goes against the grain of our own history. European history uh, is is not in the way that um, uh, extreme politicians today are presenting it. Uh, These culture wars, this identification based upon... um, very narrowly defined concepts as being a qualification for what makes you European or Belgium or British Mm. or French. This is not something that is natural to Europe. You know, it's a huge melting pot and and, and always has been Mm. and has always benefited greatly by that. But of course, we have global challenges and um, uh, change has always been a constant in history. But the pace of change today is such that people are finding it very, very difficult Mm -hmm. to cope with that. The change is happening globally. It's happening for them on a continental basis. It's happening for them nationally. It's even happening locally when they look around in their streets and they are seeing very quick changes to the demographics in the area where they they have been living all of their lives. And this is giving them a sense of unsureness as to what is going on, what is happening. And um, economic challenges, COVID uh, recently having uh, uh, brought its own individual challenges as well. All of this is coming into the mix and it's opening it up for populists to be able to give a messaging which on the face of it provides a very simple answer. But actually it does anything but that. For instance... um, the rise of uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia has been huge uh, over the last uh, couple of years throughout Europe. Now, this ought to concern us all, because what it is doing actually is it's knowing away at the very fabric of the society that we are. We are not a society or we are not societies that believe in any way in... Um, being discriminatory Mm. towards people based upon uh, their religious or cultural identity. Uh, And the second you start to do that, and this is where I always say, actually, anti-Semitism is the canary in the cage. Mm. If anti-Semitism is rising, we've got a problem in Europe, and we need to wake up and realise that something very dangerous uh, could uh, emerge out of all of this. Because that's just the starting point. Uh, And today we're seeing along with it a rise of Islamophobia, uh, which is really, to my mind, just an extension of anti-Semitism. It's nothing more than that. Um, But it's dangerous territory because ultimately, where does it all end? What would you, if you're you're faced with a a voter or or somebody who's like old and sees their neighborhoods uh, changing, um, I mean, what would you... Tell this person, and what would you um, say to people that indeed lump all people of the Muslim faith, which is I think 1.3 billion, into the one the same back, right? Um, would you would it be uh, good to say, look, let's uh, let's let's criticize what needs to be criticized? If you're worried about, let's say, uh, Salafism. Criticize Salafism. Do not criticize all people of the Muslim faith. 
whenever, let's say, an... Uh, you know, these concepts are, or, or, uh, are, are actually far too complex for your average voter. Sure. <laughs> uh, and that's why you, you end up with generalizations. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't just happen about the Islamic faith. It happens in relation to the Jewish faith. Yes. It happens in relation to other faiths. It happens in relation to religions, cultures, mm. you know. Even, I, I belong to a place called Lancashire. Mm. We still have prejudices uh, against my neighbouring county of Yorkshire. <laughs> uh, and we fought a war with them centuries ago. And we still haven't got over that, you know. So, so, so these things are very, very real. To my mind, actually, it raises a question. If you look at um, uh, a lot of the studies that have been done, those people that live in mixed communities and have had the opportunity to have interaction with one another mm -hmm. from different backgrounds and, and you know diverse backgrounds, you will find that these prejudices just simply don't exist in those communities. But yet it's in those communities that have, for instance, very few immigrants mm. living amongst them that there is this perceived fear about how so many of these so-called immigrants are going to come and they're going to take over and, you know, these sorts of arguments. Our media has a big role to play in that. But ultimately, I think the lesson from this is that actually most people, given the opportunity... They are not racist. They are not against anybody based upon their religion. Mm -hmm. um, what they concentrate much more on is, do we have shared values? And if those values are shared, the rest of it becomes a thing of beauty. It's diversity. And to, pr to press you a bit on that, um, that's what people would say. Like that a lot of people, uh, if you have a lot of immigration, let's say for in, 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 a, in a short time span, um, then people, these immigrants will naturally tend to live together. You, it's normal. And that sort of, let's say, reduces the chance that uh, the same values are being held. At least that is the argument. Um, what would you respond to that? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I think it's quite complex. Mm. I think it's quite complex, really. Uh, but, you know, I, I speak as somebody who's born and brought up in England mm. as, uh, to, to immigrant parents um, and has had a very positive experience. Not that there hasn't been challenges along the way. Have I faced racism? Yes, I have. Mm. Uh, I've been physically attacked mm. because of who I am. Uh, but, you know, equally, on the one hand, I, I've had to face the gunshots of uh, Islamist uh, extremists mm. stood uh, you know, with machine guns firing at me. And on the other hand, I've had to face far-right extremists come and target my home, mm. saying we don't want Muslims uh, in England. Mm. So, you know, people like me, we're, which is the majority of us, um, we're, we're in the middle. And it's the extremes. They have to give oxygen to one another. Well, and they're and that's very how similar they operate. in a way. They, they they're are... very similar and very, very simple mm. as well. Uh, and the problem is they're the minority. The majority is us, mm. all those of us in the centre, mm. who reject what they have to say. Yes. Well, good. I think um, that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Sajjad Karim. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck. And uh, yes, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. I hope so. It's, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. The Brussels Report Podcast.